although he spent a number of years in a different part of the world, he's actually a native of Maryland. He received his undergraduate degree in computer science and PhD in information systems from the University of Maryland. He subsequently went on to serve as a faculty member at the University of South Australia in Adelaide. And since 2005, he's been chair of health and science and a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. As testimony to his national reputation within New Zealand, he's a former chair of health informatics in New Zealand, which is the New Zealand equivalent of the American Medical Informatics Association, which is the principal scientific and professional society for health informaticians here in the United States. And also this year, he's serving on the scientific program committee of MedInfo, which is the World Congress of Medical Informatics that will be held this year in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, so Jim brings a rich experience and reputation uh, to this particular topic, which I think is both timely and, and important given the re relatively recent installation of the EPIC um, computer-based provider order entry system here at UCLA Health Systems and the ongoing deployment of the ORCID, so-called ORCID, or Cerner Millennium CPOE system within the County of Los Angeles Department of Health Services learning how we might get bang for the buck, so to speak, um, and make these systems more usable is, is especially important. Um, and I think we'll learn some important uh, details about that from Jim's talk. Um, Jim was nice enough to host me when I was in New Zealand last April when I delivered a seminar and met with the faculty at the University of Auckland. Um, so it's my great pleasure to return the paper today. So um, addressing the topic of uh, IT usability in healthcare, pragmatic usability framework. Please join me in welcoming Professor Jim Warren. Lovely introduction. I think maybe yeah, one of the remote sites could use to mute. It does seem like a little bit of feedback. All right. So yes, usability and health IT. So, um, as it, uh, just to outline the talk, uh, I'm going to say a little bit about um, New Zealand, uh, Aotearoa, Maori word for it. Um, not so much tourism information, but a, a little bit about the healthcare system that uh, I've been operating in for the past uh, nearly a decade um, as a as a informatician. Uh, then, kind of into the body of the talk to. Uh, uh, talk about the, the uh, multifaceted interplay of the concept of evaluation, evaluation of the impact of a, of a health IT, and uh, the concept of, of usability of health IT. And there's, uh, there's a lot to that relationship. And one way of putting it is that uh, funders want to hear about impact, the result of the evaluation, uh, dollars and lives and things like that. Uh, whereas users want usability. Users want to have a positive user experience, something that's efficient and accurate to work with and that they enjoy working with. I'm going to tell a story from the UK. If uh, you're familiar with stories from the UK, then you probably would be expecting about their national IT program, which uh, squander some astonishing amount, like 12 billion pounds, I think. Um, but actually, I'll tell you another story from the UK that you might have heard. In doing so, um, RCTs uh, are the you know, essential building block of clinical evidence, and I'm going to have a little poke at their effectiveness uh, in terms of building evidence for health IT. Uh, I'll do something that amounts to a little bit of a literature review and, uh, and uh, bring in some of the sources, uh, seem to be largely around the Pacific. Uh, it's a big ocean, uh, to, um, uh, that have inspired me in terms of what I think usability and evaluation are about in this domain, and then uh, sort of the big enchilada, uh, the uh, health IT evaluation framework that, uh, that we produced for the New Zealand Ministry of Health. I'll give a couple of examples of, uh, of applying that. And it's a framework that brings in both the quantitative aspects of looking at electronic medical records uh, and measuring, as well as the qualitative aspects of talking to people. All right, onward, onward and inward. Uh, so New Zealand, you may or may not have heard of it. It is not part of Australia, that's what it's worth. It's a nation of some four million people drifting on their own in the Pacific. 
Um, it has a very high performing healthcare system. We get a, a better um, uh, life expectancy than the US and, or nearly anywhere else other than Japan. Um, we do it on about a third to a half of the per capita money of the US system. Uh, which I suppose is a pretty easy target to uh, outperform, but, but still, we were very efficient, um, more so than Australia, for instance. Even. Um, we uh, actually divide uh, healthcare up into 20 district health boards, or DHBs. Um, the area, is my cursor coming through? Yeah, the uh, area around Auckland is administered by three uh, district health boards. Uh, and the others are variously around Wellington and Christchurch, and some of them are more regional. Uh, you can catch the uh, influence of, of uh, the Maori population, which is particularly in the rural areas of the uh, North Island, in some of the DHBs named Waikato, uh, Tarafiti, uh, Small Air Fonganui, and so on. Uh, WH is the next set. And uh, what else? It's largely taxpayer uh, funding based, but certainly not entirely. So 17% from uh, co-payments that are made. Uh, the district health boards are essentially funded to run public hospitals that are then free to any resident. They also run public uh, lab tests. So any lab tests that are ordered by physicians uh, while you're in the community, you uh, go to a lab testing outfit that's contracted from the DHB, and uh, other than paying your taxes, you don't pay any additional money. When you get a medication, it's a flat $5 for a bottle of any clinically indicated prescribed medication. So um, New Zealand does bulk purchasing as a country, a, a scheme that's uh, heavily under threat by various free trade agreements, but it's very cost effective. Uh, and then when you see a doctor, the doctor gets a co-payment from, uh, from the federal government, but uh, can set their rate of how much the person pays to be anything from zero to whatever they want. So they're free agents to run their business model such as they would. And there are some access practices that are free or nearly free. The GPIC at a glitzy address is more like a $120 visit. Uh, okay, so a little bit about I can go on about the system forever, but uh, probably not a good idea. Now, the uh, part of the system has a plan. So this is the National Health IT Plan, which for artistic reasons is uh, superimposed on a Kahubakawa tree, which is very long-lived and flowers very beautifully at Christmas time. Okay, it's enough museum tourism. Um, so what uh, that diagram is illustrating, among other things, is uh, at the foundation of New Zealand Healthcare, we have very well-established national health identifier number. Um, we're on the third generation of IT supporting that, uh, that. so we've recently moved from uh, homegrown systems to IBM Initiate technology, and so there's, uh, there's computer scientists here, right? Uh, so, uh, there's APIs that interface with all of the EMR systems that are used in the sector uh, to make it uh, more definite that uh, uh, every time you're working with somebody, you know just who they are and it's reconciled with uh, their identity uh, everywhere else. Uh, some of that has been uh, brought about by incentives, for instance, incentives to GPs for having 99% of their prescriptions have an NHI on them, and it's had started as a reconciliation of the public hospitals uh, identifier systems. Uh, another feature in New Zealand that's very strong is the idea of general practice, so family medicine, as I guess you term it, so the, the GP as the general practitioner and uh, the place where they work, the general practice, which usually has multiple GPs and nursing staff. Um, there, so as in the UK and Australia and the Netherlands, uh, there's a, both a strong culture of general practice, and those general practices are 100% computerized. So except for a few legal requirements, in general, they're, they're virtually paperless. If you ask a GP about a patient, they go to their computer. They don't go to a filing cabinet. Uh, and uh, so that's quite good. Uh, there is an issue. Part of what the plan, health IT plan is about is because you've got the computerized general practice and you've got the computerized public hospitals, it does potentially create barriers between the two. So a lot of what we're doing with our projects are uh, well, electronic discharge summaries, transmitted as HL7 messages, are, are ubiquitous in New Zealand. Electronic referrals is one of the projects I'll talk about that we were evaluating. And aspirationally, we're trying to not just have sort of those little ropes that are thrown between them, but to actually connect, for instance, with um, 
shared care planning to really have um, uh, a more holistic notion of the patient across the different services. Again, I could go on forever. I'll leave it there. One more concrete instance of what some New Zealand health IT might look like. Um, so those district health boards, the 20 of them, uh, they're quite sovereign. Uh, you actually, people actually get elected to the district health board, so they make their own decisions, although they're making decisions mostly with taxpayer money. Uh, the Auckland region, because the three BHBs are so um, uh, in such a fluid area, uh, decided to create a shared services organization, and that shared services organization uh, was mandated to create a thing called the Auckland Regional Test Safe. And so any lab test that's done uh, either in, uh, within the public hospitals or that's done out in the community lab testing as ordered by the GPs, for instance, will get deposited into the test safe. Uh, the test safe has recently also been augmented with uh, dispensing of, pharma of pharmaceuticals in the community. And then all of that data is available to the specialists and, and, and nurses and, and hospital pharmacists working within the walls of the public uh, health system of the public hospitals as well as the GPs and pharmacists in the community. Um, that system, so that's just that region. Different regions have different systems, uh, and those systems are not uh, in isolation of other things. The GPs, for instance, have a lot, uh, a very widespread use of cardiovascular decision support systems that operate, interoperate with their general practice system to uh, indicate a level of cardiovascular risk, uh, you know, probability of a, in five years of a heart attack and then uh, to recommend treatment. There's even competing brands of those. So in that ecosystem, in that infrastructure with its complexities, it's kind of where I've been working for the past uh, nine and a half years. Uh, and so as I speak about evaluation, I'm particularly talking about projects I've been involved with, uh, particularly in uh, helping along the National Health IT Plan with its blue collar trade. Okay. Now, the core of the talk. Evaluation, why do it? So two basic reasons, uh, sustainability and diffusion. Uh, just um, a note about kind of the vocabulary, uh, what is it, well, it is IT, right? Uh, but often I'll say CDSS or Clinical Decision Support System. So in, 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 at one level, anything that you're doing with IT and health is probably there at some level to support clinical decision, whether it's, whether it's information presentation or actually applying a degree of artificial intelligence. So again, back to cardiovascular risk management, um, it may use a modified Framingham equation to estimate cardiovascular risk, and it may then use a production rule system to recommend how to manage that risk down specific to an individual. And so I'd call that a CDSS. Uh, and that might be the kind of thing that you want to evaluate in terms of its uptake and its impact. Switching over to Epic CPOE from a, a patchwork of homegrown systems could also be an innovation that you want to evaluate. In general, I'd like to probably go a little bit more fine-grained item by item, but, but any sort of a change in the information ecosystem can be the subject of evaluation. Now, especially to the extent that that innovation is somewhat intelligent, but really for anything, because of maintenance, I mean, there's others change of clinical evidence, which means that you have to maintain. There's uh, just, just there's perfective maintenance, there's security and integrity efforts. For all these reasons, you can't pretend that a system just continues to live on without active effort. There's always an active effort to keep a system uh, maintained and up to date. And so there's always an active decision to sustain its use. And so one purpose of evaluation is the warrant for sustaining its use, and particularly then the warrant for it to survive in the face of other innovations that are going to sweep through. And as other things get added, do you, do you bring along this other system or do you leave it behind? And so the warrant for survival of the system is based in its evaluation of its impact. Furthermore, um, a bit of a fuzzy statement, but I'll say that uh, no decision support system has ever seen uh, the maximum possible uh, dominance of its use as widely as it could. You take the explain out of Harvard, a very effective diagnostic decision support system, but a lot more people could use it than do use it. The PREDICT system is one of these cardiovascular risk management systems in New Zealand. It's actually used by about half as many people as it's indicated for, but still it could be used more broadly. Uh, so whether we mean another site, another clinic, more of the users, more of the um, 
features are always the system that can potentially diffuse more, and evaluation creates the warrant for pressing ahead with that diffusion. Now let me tell a story from the UK. Uh, so to put myself in the story a little bit, so I've been a practicing health informatician right through the 1990s. Uh, during the 1990s, I started going from being kind of an AI generic kind of uh, informatician to particularly one interested in chronic condition management, also one that was interested in general practice uh, informatics, because Australia, where it's where I was in, in most all of the 90s, has a very strong culture of, of general practice medicine and general practice computing. So as such a person, I was really interested to hear that over in the UK, they had tortured into existence an acronym prescribing rationally with decision support in general practice study, Prodigy. Uh, and uh, this had the mandate from the Sowerby Center um, uh, by, by virtue of the National Health Service of the UK to create decision support for 131 conditions in general practice. Now, two of those, for instance, almost in alphabetical order, are angina and asthma. Now, if you can quickly in your mind think of 129 other general practice conditions, you realize we're talking about some pretty comprehensive general practice decision support. Uh, the scare quotes come in uh, now about the three phases, release one in 2002, because I was feeling a little let down by them at various points. So I don't know what phase one did, but I know that there was a phase four for clinical governance out of the three phases. The release one software came out in phase two, uh, only a few years after the initiative started. But then we're at 2002, seven years after it started, they, they realized that they needed a release that would do better with chronic condition management. And I say 2002 because it didn't seem like it really got deployed yet in 2002. So as the years were dragging by, I was terribly curious what was going on uh, with these initiatives. However, the UK is a, a long way geographically from, uh, uh, from Australia and New Zealand, and I didn't get over there very much. So I was really interested when I saw this article come out in the British Medical Journal. So here we are, October 2002. Now furthermore, uh, to the astute reader, the authorship, Martin Eccles is a, a professor of clinical effectiveness. Okay, and I'm like, ooh, okay, well, either got the right guy to, to measure. Uh, and Jeremy Grimshaw, very well known in the world of evidence-based medicine and guidelines. Hey, high-powered group. And then the last author, Ian Purves. Oh, he's the director of the Sowerby Center. This is, this is prodigy, awesome. And then what's the answer? The answer is that the angina and asthma components have absolutely no significant effect. No matter how you slice it, dice it, or cut it, they don't make anything better. That's the answer. And they suspect that that's because of low levels of use. So, huh, okay. And then they followed up with another article a couple months later in BMJ, where they uh, did a qualitative study. This has started to influence my thinking as well about the power of the qualitative side as compared to the quantitative side. And uh, other interesting things are happening. So Eccles is, is the head honcho author there, but Ian Purves has dropped off the list in protest. Um, and and uh, they say the timing of the guideline trigger, the ease of use of the system, and the helpfulness of the content are what let it down. Actually, I can't think of much else the decision support system might have other than time and ease of use and helpfulness. But so and it turns out also the, the training program was inadequate in the timing of the uh, So uh, the answer is it didn't work because it really, really wasn't workable and it wasn't what they wanted. Um, it gets more interesting. Now something that was kind of cool in, so where are we here, 8 November 2002, right after that first article came out, uh, BMJ was running this online response kind of thing, so Web 2.0, and it's still cool in 2002, right? Uh, and, and, and so uh, different people are chiming in with uh, their thoughts on this, and not kind of just random people, but for instance here, Ian Purves, the head of the Sowerby Center. And uh, what he says rather defensively was, well, he points out, hey, this study published in late 2002 was carried out in 97, 98. So there's always these publication delays and these things that happen with data 
Um, and furthermore, uh, it, it's not the Prodigy software. It was software based on ideas from the Prodigy system. So there's these questions of versions and timing. That when you're looking at something as dynamic, why do you call it software? OK, because it's soft, it's malleable. We can change it. And so here we're trying to generate archival evidence about something that happened a while ago and that maybe isn't exactly the thing that we were talking about. So uh, uh, with that, just taking that and leaving it in, 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 the, in the fog and mud where it lies, um, Let's think about this. Health IT is a complex intervention. There are many links in the chain to success with a computerized decision support system. One common link, link one commonly weak link in the chain is training. So, and this came up in, in that qualitative study. Uh, they were trying to train the trainers model. We'll train some people and send them back. Of course, it's expensive to train professionals, this health professional is busy and hopefully high paid, so training programs are very expensive. But the fact is, you know, it's it's not just an iPhone, it's there's a lot of functionality in most of these tools and training is probably what you need. So that, that's tricky. Um, there's the concept of the interaction of the decision support and the model of care. Now, if you're really going to give any meaningful decision support that's going to have impact, it probably means you're making changes to how care is delivered. And if you're going to make changes, and if you're going to have decision recommendations that recommend that people do different stuff, at least things in a different proportion than they used to do, you need to think, among other things, to the, uh, to the incentives, to the financial model. How does that change their income? And if the answer is, oh, well, they're you know, going to reduce their income, then you need to realize that that's going to be a pretty big barrier. Uh, further, you need to have a model of what the potential of that decision support is. And actually, some of the controversy with this prodigy-like evaluation, uh, some people said, hey, you know, the answer is, so UK GPs said the answer is, it didn't help because we already do it right. And now that's logically a valid argument. Eccles got back in with that one and said, no, 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 you guys do a terrible job. There was plenty of room for improvement. So, uh, you know, so empirically it didn't stand up in that case. But you need to think about, you know, are you fixing a problem that is a, is a big problem? Is, is what you're going to do going to close a, an area of opportunity? And then finally, for those of us who are system developers, there's uh, the issue that to do a study, especially chronic condition management decision support, but, but almost anything, you, you tend to need to run uh, for a, a substantial period of time. So this evaluation ran over six months, maybe a year. Uh, and the fact is they had you know, bleeding edge, very fresh software, very innovative software. And it was not natural to the uh, process of user experience design, as we call it now, of good uh, human-computer interaction, to lock the software for that long of a period of time. Software that's, uh, that's that innovative, you want to be getting the feedback and making changes uh, much more rapidly than that. So, it's, so there's a tension between evaluation and the natural uh, process of uh, having high usability software. Okay, so a little uh, comment on randomized controlled trials with respect to health IT evaluation. Uh, I mean, of course, they're considered a good standard of evidence. And in a biomedical trial, where you're talking about uh, human physiology, which doesn't uh, change a lot overall, I mean, we're evolving, I suppose, as a species, but not all that much. Um, you know, there's something to, uh, there's a lot to be said for it. But um, to, to uh, perhaps take a harsh characterization of an, IC, of an RCT, an RCT is there to determine <laughs> reject the null hypothesis of no effect on one dependent variable. The answer you get from it is one bit of information. Yes, I can reject the null, or no, I can't. Um, on one measure, as compared to one control, for one specific protocol of implementation over a specified time period and in the context in which it was measured. Uh, now, the thing is that, uh, for, uh, okay, you can have covariates and so on, so I'm a little harsh, but uh, health IT context. Well, so GPs in the north of England in 1992 and uh, uh, clinicians at UCLA in 2015, is the context of use the same? 
maybe for some purposes, for other purposes, maybe not, you know, and so, uh, you know, things like iPhones pop up and change the way uh, we do things. Our financial models uh, are different from an NHS employee to a person working here. There's a lot of things that could be different. So the external validity of RCTs and health IT evaluation is always, I think, going to be sort of challenged. Just a comment. Okay. So, um, Something to think about is, is that as we start to now unpack usability and evaluation, I've thrown a lot of things on me. What do we want from our health IT, from our clinical decision support system? Well, ideally, we want health impact, right? Positive health impact, improvement in uh, quality of life, improvement in uh, A1C, which is well enough correlated to all kind of other good outcomes for the patient, or you know, actual raw survival uh, one year after an event, uh, things of that nature. It's real outcomes is, is ideally what we'd like. Often what we need to settle for as evaluators is a process outcome. So the idea that we have, uh, and, and these are some of the ones that have the best evidence in clinical decision support is, for instance, a, a higher immunization rate, which I understand could be used in Beverly Hills, uh, or uh, better documentation of risk factors, things of that nature. Usability is also something we can measure. It's not the end unto itself, but it's a bad sign if when we evaluate we find that usability is poor. The best measure of usability is that people use it, that they've made the decision to uh, not work around it, uh, and uh, that they continue to go on to use it, and ideally even that it spreads by word of mouth and they encourage others to use it. That's really good. What are some of the components of usability? There are actually only five, uh, and probably only three that you think of most of the time. So usability is uh, efficiency, if you will. How long does it take to do the task with the tool? It is error rate. How accurate are you in doing the task with the tool? Then it's further. How long does it take you to learn that tool to a certain level of proficiency? And if you're an intermittent user, how well do you retain that knowledge from occasion to occasion? And then uh, the big but fuzzy one uh, is subjective satisfaction. Are you happy about being in the position of using that tool? And so, and you can make composites of the idea that you know 90% of users can uh, attain a certain working speed after a certain amount of learning effort, for instance, might be a usability requirement. All right, now I'm going to start wandering around the Pacific. Uh, so let's start in Sydney. So uh, Joanna Westbrook is uh, quite an influential thinker in health IT evaluation. Uh, I'm definitely a fan of her work, and uh, one of her specific publications here was uh, about the uh, context of wicked problems and socio-technical theory as applied to health IT evaluation. And in particular, she featured um, the concept of it being multi-method. So uh, I hope that's large enough. Uh, but what we've got there is several different domains of, of impact for health IT. Work and communication patterns. We, it, it's information communication technology. So it, it, you'd hope it would have an influence that way. Uh, organizational culture. If you're changing how people work, if you're uh, improving patient outcomes, you may have a, an impact on organizational culture. And then the sort of more traditional impact, safety and quality of the healthcare itself. And uh, what she uh, particularly asserts is that you have different methods of measurement for these different things. So you might uh, give people a survey to understand culture. You might do um, uh, an analysis of charts or records to understand safety and quality. You might do time and motion-based studies to uh, observe communication patterns. There's, uh, so, so there are two things there. One is that there are multiple methods of, of measurement, very divergent ways of measuring. And secondly, there are multiple criteria. There are multiple kinds of things that you may be interested in measuring and that the impact of any health IT innovation is going to be uh, a, 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 a multi-dimensional impact, a broad multi-dimensional impact. 
With respect to, to uh, Joanna Westbrook's work specifically, one of her big contributions is in time and motion studies. Um, she tortured an acronym into existence, but I think it's, it is worth it, uh, so the Wombat system. Um, and uh, while I'm mainly a fan of what she does, uh, I find this photo absolutely hilarious. The research assistant looking down her nose at the healthcare worker as she studies the time and motion of the, you know, the presumably nurse. You know. You know, now the nurse is going into the restroom. Now the nurse is lowering her drawers. She's passing 700 milliliters of urine. And it's all logged very carefully. Very expensive to do time and motion studies, although very informative to uh, a number of aspects. So uh, she's had the funding there in Australia to uh, do quite a few of those. I haven't had as much chance to use time and motion. I actually tend to avoid it because it's very expensive. Uh, but she's developed a great tool that records uh, for time and motion studies to record uh, what's going on, who's doing it, how are they doing it, when are they doing it, where are they doing it. Uh, actually, it's at where they're doing it. The when is automatic by the tool. It's because it's meant to be being used in real time. Another big influence. I'll come over to this side of the Pacific and uh, over to California. We've got Alan Cooper. Uh, his delightful book, "The Inmates Are Running the Asylum." Uh, so Cooper is responsible for the interface of the original Visual uh, Studio or Visual Basic environment before Visual Studio. Uh, he's a consultant to uh, Apple and Google, and uh, at least claims a lot of credit for uh, how their things work. Um, and so uh, some of his interaction design uh, concepts uh, include the idea of having the user directly involved in the design team, um, focusing on getting the right features, not adding features just because they are easy to be added, but adding the features that are what's actually needed, iterating. So if it's not quite right, you keep changing the design until you've got the design that is right. Uh, and it's the user, not the programmer, that says what is right. Uh, what was it that um, Steve Jobs said? Making it insanely great. So that's kind of a, you know, Apple with the extreme version of that. But uh, those principles are very important. That's how you achieve good usability. So when you process these, this, represent at least some of the components of the Cooper type design. Uh, moving just up the coast to Victoria and British Columbia, there's there's two really smart gentlemen there. Well, there's probably more than two, but two that I'll point out. Uh, so uh, Professor Francis Lau uh, had put forward an evaluation uh, framework um, that, and, and uh, Robert Reed mentioned Sarah Muttick the other day, I'm going to off there on this. Uh, and, and he said, look, he, he made it into a, into a cube. He says there are different things that you can talk about the quality of the system, the quality of the information, the quality of the service. There are uh, different aspects of, of usage, the use and the user satisfaction. Uh, and perhaps it's how I get that dichotomy. And uh, there are different dimensions of benefit, the quality, the access, the productivity. So uh, again, Francis is giving us some similar concept to what Joanna Westbrook was about this multidimensional uh, aspect to it. From uh, the same department of uh, health information science, we've got Andre, unpronounceable surname. It's not Kushner, but I just call him Kushnerik. Andre. Hmm? Kushnerik. Kushnerik. Sure. Um, at any rate, does some wonderful, the usability of the surname I wouldn't give credit to, but he, he does uh, wonderful things with detailed usability assessment. Uh, and one of his assertions is that you don't need a special usability lab, that the modern computer uh, plus an additional camera to add context, if you can record the context of the interaction, record the screen, record the user's perspective, including their voice, uh, then you've pretty much got what you want. And he's shown that you can do usability studies with, with users that are in Japan, that are remote from you. Um, and uh, further, the, obviously, even the title of one of their publications is um, the use of the Think Aloud protocol. So the idea of in a realistic near live, in a realistic environment with a realistic user, to have them think aloud, to, to talk through what, they're, what they think they're doing step by step, will give you that rich qualitative data that lets you potentially make a better 
system. You not just measure the performance and go, oh, it took 13 and a half minutes, is that good enough or not? But what were they doing at every step? How were they conceiving of what they were doing? So very influential. Uh, all right, and then not so influential, but what you're hearing about is, is then, so the synthesis I take. So I wanted to credit some of those individuals just to say where I was getting some of this from. Um, I would assert the correctness of the decision recommendations uh, isn't everything, but it's essential. As I say, they have to be giving the right information or the right computation on the information. Usability isn't everything, but it's critical. It's possible to succeed with relatively low usability, but just barely possible. Uh, and use in the real world setting is necessary. That's what the, how the impact is generated. If you, you can measure and find that there was a positive influence, even if there wasn't use, but that's just because of an error in your protocol, and it happened that something improved rather than getting worse, which you know, is sort of a 50% chance of that happening at any time. Uh, so that, that use is the, is the necessary component in uh, something actually correctly being evaluated to have an impact. Um, so we need to look at the use and the impact of use on the decision quality for the patient outcome. Right. So the framework of health IT evaluation, I'm moving reasonably well through this one, lots of questions at a time. Um, I say that now, I slowed down, I'll end up taking too much time. Still have examples. The framework. First, establish a relevant benefits framework. That is to say, what is the, what was the system thought to be good for? Now it's amazing that in cases where myself, my group have been brought in to evaluate something, you go, well, what did you actually think the impact would be? And you start drilling into that, and it's amazing how hard it is to necessarily find the thing that you're supposed to measure, you know. Oh, well, it was meant to lead to better decisions. Okay, what's that look like? How am I going to measure that there were that there were better decisions? You know, or um, so. Uh, and it's fascinating. That even the business cases for a lot of health IT projects often uh, are very hard to pin down ultimately on their on uh, the measurable impact. Some sometimes, you don't. but anyway, make that explicit. If it hasn't been already, make the benefits framework explicit. It's the first step in evaluation. Further principle, always use the transactional electronic medical record data. So these systems leave footprints. So they have uh, records generally of their access. They have records of the inputs that were recorded, uh, hopefully records of the outputs that were produced. Uh, and then there's the, the further action that happens. And often in the, in the timing of those actions, we can learn a lot and we can learn absolutely essential information about simply the uptake. Who logs into the system? How often? How often are they using it? Uh, is, its use, is its use being sustained? Second fundamental principle, in addition to using the transactional data, is to always talk to people. So it's nice to have data in the, in the sense of the, the objective system data, but also talk to the stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders? The stakeholders are managers. The stakeholders are potentially patients, although often they don't have, depending on the system, they don't, um, you know, stakeholders are always patients, but they, 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 they may or may not have good insight into what's changed about the system. Um, the stakeholders are also the, uh, the IT people, so the IT vendors that have produced the system, and the IT people often, say, working for the hospital that need to operate the system. And then, of course, it's the users, the clinicians, that are actually doing most of the work with the system. If it's a consumer-facing system, then it's more directly the patients as well. Nice academic words. Action research, grounded theory, theoretical sampling. Okay, because that's, that, that gets you published. What we mean is that you um, ask people not just about how well it's working, but how it could work better. Um, you don't pretend to be just a, um, an inert measuring device, but you, you admit to taking a stance of wanting to have the system work. It doesn't mean you falsify your data, but it does mean that, uh, that you're, you're actively looking for solutions. Uh, and then grounded theory, which means you listen. Okay, so to some extent, because you have a benefits framework, it's not pure grounded theory. The benefits framework creates your hypotheses about what's going to have been happening. But 
the um, grounded theory comes in, which is when people say interesting things, you're willing to take it on board. And the theoretical sampling comes in, that when people say interesting things, you then go and talk to more people that will elaborate on that emergent theme. So if somebody says, uh, I mean, okay, I'll make it a, a, a small one, but um, the ability to attach images to this referral just completely sucks. It's awful. It's unusable. You go, oh, okay. So it's not a particularly theoretically deep emerging theme, but it's, it's not something maybe you were expecting. Now you triangulate from there. You talk to a few other people about attaching images, and you get the idea, was that person just a weirdo or an outlier, or was, was that really the case? Furthermore, you can triangulate back to the EMR data and go, well, were people attaching images or not? And it happens in one of our e-referral systems uh, that I'll talk about in a minute, that uh, you, after we looked at it, after somebody commented, we looked back and we went, oh, wow, yeah, that's a really low rate of attaching images as compared to what you'd expect for, for a certain kinds of referral. And, hey, he's probably right that it's really hard. So uh, just, yeah, okay. grounded theory action research. And then disseminate broadly and often. That is to say that, uh, so ideally, you'd like to do evaluation as early as possible. Ideally, you would like implementation not to be a big bang, but to be a stage affair, whether it's one site at a time, one department at a time, one function at a time, um, so that you can uh, learn about what's going on and then feed that back to people. There's two kinds of feedback um, that are valuable. One of them is to simply let them know that they've been listened to. To go, hey, I know that this, we've heard how bad this feature is, and hopefully you can follow up and say, and we're working on how we're going to make it better, and here's our time frame. So that, in the sense of action research, helps to realize a successful implementation because people understand that you're listening to them. The second, I'm sure I got this from Joanna Westbrook, is the idea that if you feed back to show them that their performance is improving, often uh, often uh, implementation is a painful process. The change is a painful process. And if people are doing more work or working a different way, you feel they're working harder, if you can feed back, uh, without lying, um, that look, you know, though the, the quality of our reports is better or our, our compliance guidelines is better or something good is happening, then that creates that warrant and that uh, to say, hey, sustain your energy and keep up with this effort. Now, um, so uh, the first three domains here are drawn directly from Joanna Westbrook, and uh, I also then separated off clinical effectiveness. But when I say multi-criteria, I mean there are a lot of criteria available. So on the last slide, by the way, I'll give a URL where you can download a, a document version of this talk, and it has this, this diagram in it, just for those who don't panic, because uh, I don't think I'm going to go through every one of them. But uh, again, we can look at the impact on working communication patterns, on organizational culture, so, such as how people respond to the idea of, you know, do I feel I'm able to do my job safely working with this system? Um, and, and, and there's an interaction. So just as Joanna drew those three overlapping, there's then safety and quality, safety both part of, of culture and of, of quality, uh, and clinical effectiveness also. Uh, over overlaps, but then the specific indicators of uh, successful patient management, the adherence to evidence-based guidelines, uh, or the true hard outcomes like mortality and, and, and length of stay and things of that nature. So those are all in the impact genre of criteria. So I had to come up with fancy words like genre because I already have used the word domain. So there's all those kind of criteria. Uh, and then just uh, to underscore, for instance, logging of screen access times gives you a little bit of uh, insight into uh, how often people are using something. And if you combine that with a bit of uh, observation in the workplace, you can tell how much of that is actual work and how much of it is interruption. Uh, Joanna Westbrook's um, uh, thesis supervisor, Enrico Cogliera, famously said interruption is one of the ways that you often get uh, iatrogenic error in health information systems. People make errors because they get inter interrupted, so that's worth uh, noticing too, uh, just underscoring interruption. Next page of the criteria pool, or the other wing of the pool. Um, oh, uh, oh, just a few others. Reported feelings that systems say self report that efforts are effectiveness effective. So those are sort of soft qualitative elements of culture. Okay. Second page of the criteria pool. 
the genre of the product. So uh, the product needs to have good IT characteristics to be stable, secure, have uptime, uh, comply with standards, uh, decent response time. Uh, we had seen some problems with that, for instance, in one of the systems we were evaluating. And then I count usability under the product genre, although it does also overlap the impact genre. So the efficiency component of usability, the accuracy component of usability, obviously, is directly about the system impact. A lot of the others are, uh, I count as, as product features, such as satisfaction and learnability, and of course the uptake, which again is, is essential. Uh, you can also talk about the factors, whether you've got a good vendor. And then the factors of the process, and this amounts to pretty much uh, how, much, how painful was the transition to the new system. Uh, and uh, one of my colleagues, Karen Day, did her whole thesis on the role of leadership in, uh, in the transition to a new system and how much a leader can do to uh, both to ensure uh, or make more likely the success of a large implementation product, project as well as to relieve the pain and uncertainty and anxiety of people as they go through an implementation project. Um, and then there's conventional project management goals, which is, is it on time and within budget? Then it was good. I don't care what it did to the health of the people. I don't care how traumatic it was for the staff. If it was on time and on budget, it was good. Sorry, I'm being harsh on project managers. It's very important that you get those things too. But often, those are the only criteria that are actually applied to the project. After all, and I just want to show that the pool is a lot wider than that. Okay. Uh, underscoring a few, uh, rate and extent of uptake, persistence of the use of workarounds, physicians in particular very resourceful at finding workarounds, so one of the best measures of usability is use. All right. Now, remember that New Zealand with its 20 DHBs uh, and its Kahutakawa tree-based uh, National Health IT Plan, let me talk about a couple of projects that I've been in. Uh, and we were actually commissioned to create that evaluation framework at the front of a particular set of projects leading to a review of electronic referrals. So again, electronic referrals, we basically mean from a GP practicing in the community uh, creating a message probably going to be sent by uh, Health Level 7 to the uh, public hospital. That's particularly the quintessential electronic referral that we're talking about. Now, we were evaluating those at a period from uh, mid August, uh, from mid 2010, and we were there because e referrals were an essential part of the National Health IT plan because of that need to connect the, the, the community and, and hospital sectors. Uh, and uh, the ministry wanted to know, the Ministry of Health wanted to know uh, which technology options and implementations were working best, uh, what refinements should be done, and what benefits to, to expect. So just, you know, Jim, answer the questions. Uh, and uh, there were a number of district health boards that had already gone uh, ahead with electronic referrals. I, I'll tell you about what we found out when we looked at Hutt Valley, which is the area just north of uh, the capital, Wellington. Uh, and uh, when we look at Canterbury, which is the, the region on the South Island, all the flatland on the South Island uh, around Christchurch. And it was particularly preparatory to the fact that the big Auckland metro region, which is, has a third of the population in New Zealand, was a, just about to implement the referrals. Okay. So uh, Sun Valley is a traditionally rural area, but increasingly becoming a suburb for people who work in Wellington. Uh, they have gone ahead and in 2000 were relatively early in the New Zealand context implementing the referral solution. So uh, there's one major hospital, a hospital, clever name, uh, that uh, has 30 general practices, so that's 30 different sites with multiple GPs and, and nurses, uh, referring using the uh, most common uh, um, brand of uh, GP EMR uh, in New Zealand. Uh, there are 28 specialist services in the hospital, and 16 of them created a, a service-specific e-referral form. The other dozen went with a, a generic referral form. The electronic management solution provided um, the GP with a, a receipt that the uh, message had been received at the hospital. Uh, so, which is a great improvement over a fax, right? Because then, well, you have to follow up with a phone call if you actually care to find out whether the fax machine had paper in it or such. Uh, so, so you get a, a, a receipt, um, 
uh, upon sending it to the hospital, you then, the GP gets a notice about the uh, decision that's made on this. So the public hospital actually can decline a referral. They can say, we're too busy, you don't meet the criteria. Um, you know, the, this gent doesn't need a colonoscopy from us. Okay? He can go to the private sector if he really, if you and he continue to think he needs it, but we don't think he needs it. So you can be declined or you can be prioritized as urgent, semi-urgent or routine beyond that. And then eventually there's the FSA, the first specialist appointment. So when the uh, referral actually uh, takes effect and the patient has showed up at the special service. So notifications of all those are now made in the electronic workflow. Um, and the hospital can also see uh, the referrals that are still pending triage. Uh, and anybody in the hospital system can, through their clinical workstation, the Orion Concerto that's used in New Zealand, uh, can have a look at the referrals. The referral letters often say very important things about a patient. The patient pending So these are some of the things, that, some of the mechanisms of the referral uh, solution that might potentially generate benefit. So one of the first and best things we looked at was uptake. Um, so the, the green line represents how many e-referrals were sent uh, uh, each year. Uh, so they implemented in 2007, it got a little bit of use, and then uh, it, it, it started to have its sustained level of use in 2008, 9, and 10. That's a good looking curve. So it didn't go back down uh, and it got substantial. Now, uh, because they also have a PIMS, a, a general hospital information system, we have an idea of how many uh, total referrals there are. So the, the green line, the e referrals, we got from the e referral system because uh, it was tracking how many of those things off of the general practice systems it sent over the network. Uh, but then the hospital system says, says how many referrals came in total. And actually, it was a little bit hard to reconcile with one with the other sometimes. Um, now, our key referral solution vendor was really upset with us that uh, this number wasn't higher. But, well, that's just too bad. It's the reality. Um, and a lot of people said, hey, that looks like a failure in some ways. They said it looks like a failure. Uh, and then some curse words. Um, it's that the way it breaks down is that uh, for those practices that had the ability to send, well, that ever demonstrated the ability to send an electronic referral, 71% of their referrals were electronic, so somewhat higher proportion than total. So just to say there are other places referring in the hospital that at least never, either never had the solution or never, never sent any e-referrals, so they never really implemented the solution. Uh, but also does say that on the whole, practices that send electronically also sometimes use other mechanisms. It suggests that if you push for uh, a model that said, look, it must be 100% electronic, that you would have a backlash, because that's not what the users have wanted to do. But yet they did want to do a lot of electronic referrals. Is there still the potential for benefit, or have we wasted a lot of time? The answer is, there's the potential for benefit. So this far into a talk, this far into the day, is the perfect time to look at a cumulative frequency distribution graph, I think. You're a clever bunch, you can do it. Okay, so the black line across the lower end of the curve is paper in paper referrals in 2007. So that's kind of the initial situation. And what this is saying is how many days did it take for a priority to be assigned to a referral? So that might mean to decline it, say it's routine, semi-urgent, or urgent. Now, so the 0.5 line is telling you about the median. The median was at about a week. I find a very important place to look to be the upper quartile. What is 75%? So that's to say if you're just a little bit unlucky, you're in the, the, the longest quartile, you actually would have been waiting uh, two weeks for your referral to be given prior, to be assigned a priority. And that's, that's not great. Um, what we find then, kind of hopping to the answer, is that for the electronic referrals in 2008 and 2009, almost the same curve, which is good. It got even a little bit better at the tail end in 2009. Um, we've got this big space, and that's to say that the time to assign priority went from about two weeks as the upper quartile to down to about one week with the electronic referral. The further thing that's worth checking is, hey, not all those referrals were electronic. What happened to the paper ones? And the answer is with some of the, the, the middle line, uh, is that the paper ones, most importantly, didn't get worse 
Okay, so it's not that the paper got left behind, uh, but in fact it improved a little bit, but not. But there's a big, and you know, all these gaps are significant because it's based on a very large number of transactions. Uh, the, the electronic is handled fast, more reliably faster, but paper didn't suffer. As a matter of fact, paper improved just slightly too, maybe because they had more, <laughs> they had less paper that they had to uh, sort through. So this was a solid enough quantitative kind of result. This is what the literature likes, so we are able to publish that in a PubMed index type of journal. Um, so that uh, that is, you know, and if you're waiting for um, uh, to, to be referred for a colonoscopy, uh, one week versus two weeks, that can make a little bit of difference on how you're going to uh, do. Uh, okay, so that's just a little bit about how we were valuing cloud. Uh, now, Canterbury, as we say, they were doing electronic referrals as well, so down on the South Island. Um, they're, they're innovative, lucky people on the South Island. Uh, they put packaged their initiative as Health Pathways. And something that's interesting about it is that it didn't start out as an electronic referral management solution. It started out as locally agreed methods, pathways, for managing conditions. Now, an interesting thing is they created, by the time we got to talk to them, um, 300 pathways. Now, that's actually just as ambitious as that Prodigy project that we talked about before with its 180 or whatever it was uh, uh, different guidelines. So they created 300 pathways. Uh, and not initially, but after they were going for oh, just several months, a year, they started creating their electronic referral management, which is to say that from the pathway, which was already kind of a hypertext, that you could link it over to an electronic referral form. And they created 100 or more distinct electronic referral forms off of their health pathways. There was a real emphasis on GP empowerment. Uh, so two things that they did, actually starting at the bottom, is uh, the, the Canterbury District Health Board remembered that they were District Health Board and that they could control General, the flow. General practitioner. What? General practitioner. Great. Thanks. General practitioner. Yeah, a family family physician. Uh, yeah, sorry, speaking in Commonwealth parlance. Uh, so yeah, the, the family doctors uh, who are organized as the College of General Practitioners um, uh, were able to get additional specific training. Uh, so the, the ozone hole is kind of still a little bit of a thing on that in Southern Hemisphere. And so particularly for the rural component of the hut community, uh, skin uh, cancers on exposed skin are an extremely common event. Um, you know, And so uh, they trained GPs to do the skin excisions. You don't need to be referred to dermatology at hut hospital. A GP can cut a skin cancer off the hand. Uh, and since some of the GPs are trained to do that and some aren't, you actually then would have the effect of GP to GP referral. Um, furthermore, GPs could be taken out of their uh, family practice offices and could sit in a community referred radiology center. So one of the real backlogs was uh, ultrasound and things of that nature. And there the GPs would do the triaging and would give feedback to their fellow GPs about why a referral might be declined. And this would help to disseminate an understanding of the referral criteria. And both those things represent the District Health Board manipulating the money flow to achieve something different. Um, the development process was sort of fascinating. The fact that they could make 300 of them, but they had a systematic process of five 90-minute evenings to make a health pathway, an experienced facilitator, 300 at some point, um, and they only had a, they had a, they only had a couple of facilitators, uh, and the idea was that the, G, the, the family doctors and the specialists would have a robust discussion. Uh, given their medical talents, they're usually able to stop all the bleeding from that robust discussion uh, before the 90 minutes ended. But so they'd have at each other, and they would, um, you know, build a relationship. And often it's the same people working on mobile guidelines, uh, and then they would disseminate the pathway to the rest of the community through information evenings. Uh, and then, of course, they had built-in systemic ways of giving feedback that when uh, referrals get declined, there's reasons given. And this was uh, particularly highly developed in the community referred radiology uh, component. Uh, and again, a quantum of funding for community-based procedures to the extent that the um, pathway might ask the GP to do something different. They try to attach money for doing that. Uh, this is just an instance 
of one of the pathways, the pathway for heavy menstrual bleeding. Uh, it has links to a couple of different kinds of referral that might occur. And actually one of the most uh, operational and uh, impactful parts of it is that it empowers the GP to make a decision based on a pipel biopsy uh, without an ultrasound uh, if an ultrasound isn't available. So the idea is that their local community has said this is the pathway, now it's okay, you're not doing malpractice by doing this. Not that they're sensitive about malpractice in uh, New Zealand as the US, but it's an empowerment that says, your community says this is the way you can do it. Um, about the evaluation, I really spent a lot of time just saying what that was, but we, we found it very exciting what we, what we found in the way their system worked. Um, here's one interesting use graph. Um, I actually can't read the number there, but it's, it's substantial. Each day of the week, Monday through Friday, the health pathways are being accessed. They're being accessed at a pretty steady level through the weekdays. And this is indicating the day-to-day -day use of the pathways, hundreds of accesses each day. Um, it's also showing us a huge dip on the weekend. And when there's a three-day weekend, it shows it for three days. That's because the general practices are operating on only sort of a, you know, the, the semi-emergency kind of, uh, of level of appointments during the weekend. So what it says is that they're not reading the guidelines out of interest. If they were reading the guidelines out of interest, they'd probably have more time on the weekend and less during the week. It's saying the pattern is they're using them to trace the workflow case by case by case, which is exactly how they were meant to be used. Um, and uh, in this case, we weren't able to say a lot more quantitatively about impact. At that time, Canterbury region had multiple hospitals with divergent systems, and it was beyond our budget to squeeze the records out of the multiple systems, unlike a hospital where we were working with one. They've since had a project to reconcile their hospital information systems, but at that point, we went with stakeholder interviews that indicated the reduced uh, cues for, for instance, for ultrasound. One more example. So from the top of the Pahutukawa tree, we had the concept of shared care planning. So there, uh, that was the, the aspirational level of the National Health IT Plan. And uh, so uh, we got involved with the uh, trial of the, the pilot of the National Shared Care Planning Program, which was run conveniently enough for us in Auckland. Uh, this diagram actually does a great job of showing the health sector. So you've got uh, the patient and their family, or great Maori word, whānau. Fanal is essentially whoever is functionally your family. That might include your brother-in-law's girlfriend, your grandma, your cousin. Uh, often there's a lot of people in a Maori household. So your, your fanal is the people that, uh, that you're, you're, you're working with. If you really want to perfect WH, it's a bilabial fricative, which is like an F, but without biting your lower lip. I can't do it very well. Um, so you've got your family in fanal. You've got your, um, the specialists and the uh, specialist physician and nurse. You've got your general practice physician and nurse in, in the family practice. Uh, and you've got the, the, the others that are out there, the district nurse uh, that drives out to people. It's quite developed in the Canterbury region, for instance. Uh, and, 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 and the other at pharmacy physio, et cetera. OK, and so your shared care should be shared amongst all those. So just a couple components of the evaluation uh, we did there. So what you were looking at in this case is just uh, some quantitative records directly from the shared care management system uh, for three particular practices that joined at different times during the uh, phased rollout of the shared care pilot. Um, and we find some interesting things. They're enrolling reasonable numbers of people, 42 at this practice, 51 at that practice. The, this third practice hadn't, it came in later. They hadn't done as many yet, so that's okay. Uh, those numbers are, are modest. It's, it's indicating they're, they're, they're enrolling their highest complexity patients within certain domains. Certainly, they would have a lot more chronic condition management patients. They could have been enrolling, uh, you, you could have multiplied that by 10 almost, I would have said, if they were enrolling everybody, but they're enrolling some. Um, but some things that were uh, very indicative of the model of, uh, of use uh, or, or the, the, the actual mode of use, the size of the teams that we were creating was mostly two or three people. So for instance, maybe GP, practice nurse, and specialist nurse, something like that. Uh, there were different compositions to the kinds of people that were, that were users. Um, 
And the number of actual, for instance, task assignments for um, my font smaller than the one that you're seeing, uh, or notes that were entered, were fairly, fairly modest. So the, the usage was a bit sparse. When we looked into the logs, uh, we could see, for instance, maybe for a very um, complex heart failure patient who's moving, who's seeing both the cardiology at the hospital and the GP both kind of regularly. It's a it's a scratch board for them to communicate to each other and 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 to send warnings to each other to watch out certain things about how the patient's going and so on. Much more elegant than a referral solution where you throw the patient over the wall and then they get thrown back. Okay, so uh, very nice for care coordination, but probably not the image that was portrayed by this diagram. That would be a much bigger care team and with a little bit more activity. Furthermore, um, just to illustrate some of the qualitative interview-based stuff, so we do interview patients when, uh, when they actually potentially have a go at the system. Um, and so uh, here are a couple of patients that were participating in the shared care planning uh, project. Um, and uh, a few things they're saying, uh, uh, you know, it's great the idea of, of a plan that's, that's about what I'm wanting to do. So this is exactly Kate Lorig's theory of care planning, is, is the care plan should be about what the patient wants to achieve, not just the evidence-based clinical uh, objectives, targets. Uh, and for the patient saying that, you know, it's great that I can be in contact in between visits. Now, the thing was, these did this sound innocent, these sound very positive. They were extremely challenging patient comments vis-a-vis -vis how the system was operating. So the problem was, that uh, the, the clinical teams in the community and the hospital were willing to use, willing and able to use the system to better coordinate care, to do what they saw as their role about getting the medications right and monitoring correct for a heart failure patient. But they actually were not very keen to take the time to do a, a truly patient-centered care plan or to embrace and follow up that plan. Um, or to uh, pretend that it was a Kaiser Permanente portal and allow the patient to send the messages. Uh, this absolutely uh, um, absolutely rejected by the specialists in particular because they said, hey, I don't want the patient putting a message on this system. It's not part of my job to look at the system. And so, you know, I don't want them to put a message on there that should have been dealt with immediately and have it sit there for a month uh, until somebody happens to look at it. So the problem was that uh, the technology was working. It's usability. They, they were throwing stones at the usability, but its usability was actually adequate. The problem was the bigger changes that were going to be needed in the healthcare system in terms of people's roles, in terms of people's uh, uh, financial incentives for the roles that were being asked by the kind of transformation that really the system was trying to support. So we had to give them back, kind of, uh, give back to the ministry uh, a kind of difficult report that said you need to make more fundamental changes in people's roles and expectations before you're going to be able to use this technology uh, in the way that it's it's really designed for. So bringing it home, um, usability evaluation and overall evaluation are interlinked in a number of ways. Um, usability is, is, is necessary to overall impact, or certainly use is. And the pattern of usage gives you a lot of insight into uh, what's working and what isn't working. So you can start to look at who is or isn't using the system, who is or isn't using a certain feature. So uh, back to the HUT system, which was, was an overall success in terms of impact, Still, we could talk to people about, you know, oh, it's, it's being difficult to attach images, so it's not really working for the dermatology referral as well as we'd like. Certain users were experiencing uh, uh, excessive latency time to load attachments, and so the, they were getting really upset about the usability because of that system performance issue. Um, so, you know, as you follow into usability, you can find out what's good and what could be better. Um, you need to be pragmatic. You'll never be able to do the perfect evaluation for all those criteria, for all the things and ways that you might measure. Um, it's going to be too expensive and too long. Pragmatic evaluation is doing something that's right size. Now, certainly you should fight for the budget for evaluation, both in terms of time and dollars. 
but uh, it, it, it's a pragmatic compromise, and it should be right size to the size uh, of the project that you're evaluating. In New Zealand, these projects are quite small. Hutt Valley is a small district health board with 150,000 people under its management or something. You can only have so big of a project. They wouldn't have had an evaluation project even as large as they did, except that it was uh, because they were a leader of the national level who was interested in what they had done. Uh, so if you have time to talk to three users, talk to three users. And ideally listen, well, definitely listen, and ideally be able to follow up. Which further is about the whole structure of health IT projects. Uh, health IT projects that get in, rip the old thing out, put the new thing in, and get a, a changeover, uh, and then say they're done, I believe are, are wholly inadequate. Okay, or they're, they're an incredible leap of faith. I suppose you do that. Um, what you want is to evaluate, preferably even pre-implementation, at the earliest pilot stages and through the phases of implementation and afterward. And indeed, there is no exactly afterward. Continuing. Because a project is, is never over unless you've declared it a failure and turned it off. Always the project continues to maintenance, the, if you want to call it that, perfective maintenance, the finding out what could be better and making it better, the further diffusion, the further features, uh, um, the further usability, all those things should continue. And we need project plans, we need budgets that are set out in that fashion. Doing this kind of work is certainly something that one doesn't do alone. So the National Institute for Health Innovation is a unit within the School of Population Health that uh, I used to be embedded with, I'm now work alongside of. Uh, and so uh, some of the immediate people, Helen Du, Gail Humphrey, and Malcolm Pollock, that I worked with in that, some of the other uh, academics, Karen Day, consultant Sue White, that were involved in the, in the project. And of course, there was a, a hundreds of stakeholders that we harassed in our, in our efforts. Um, you can find my webpage, you can contact me by email, and you can download uh, a paper that is essentially the core of this talk, including the criteria pool. And with that, I would thank you and take questions. Thank you, Ramon. Uh, I have a question. Please. So, thank you for the great talk. Um, I was uh, thinking about your cumulative distribution charts. Mm. Did you, you said you had a lot of data, did you stratify by type of response you would get from the referral and look at that? Interesting. So the question, if you didn't hear it, is did we stratify the cumulative distributions from the Hutt Valley um, uh, evaluation? Um, the simplest answer would probably be no. Yeah, so that, that, that that's an interesting hypothesis. Did they take longer to respond if they were going to respond no <laughs> than if they were going to respond yes? Uh, no, no, I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't, I, I, yeah, that's, uh, the, the data still exists. Uh, could probably try to, try to figure that out. Um, we do know, I mean, a few things I can say about the process. Part of why it would speed things up is, um, I mean, part of it is the ability to recognize that a referral is old, okay? So paper sitting in a pile, if anything works you the other way, things go to the bottom of the pile and, and, and call your attention less as they get older instead of more, whereas when you can just specifically see how old something is, it's just right there to, to be dealt with. There's also the issue that people go on leave. Uh, we've got quite good leave policies in New Zealand. I'm, I, I get five weeks of leave. Um, and so, and, and you know, and people go overseas and stuff at, at high rates. Um, the idea it's not locked in a filing cabinet or something, but it, it's, it's secure in a system to authorized users. So the idea that people can job share more on a set of referrals than, than otherwise. And so these are some of the things that we think happen. There is actually, I don't know if it showed there, um, there was just an ever so slight crossover, I don't think it is visible at that resolution, that there were perhaps more same day, just slightly more same day um, triages when it was paper. Okay, so there was, they actually perhaps were more sensitized probably to the follow up phone call and things like that uh, back when it was paper, so they became more routinized at least slightly.
did you look at the number of say total like rejections or total rejection? Ah, oh, yeah. Are there maybe more rejections? Right, right. Uh, and look again, you, again, you, you got me for for hot. Uh, uh, in Canterbury, you can be co-author on the next paper for that. Um, with, uh, with Canterbury, with the uh, community referred radiology, uh, they indeed made a, a science out of rejection and made it into a very positive, well, very positive, tried to really make it into a positive element of what was going on. So they were very explicit about it. The, the, the hut system, I, I know, I don't think was uh, uh, as elegant. I think there probably was room to put in a rejection re re reason. So I never heard anything from the stakeholders about the management of it. Whereas uh, in Canterbury, they really featured and really led with letting us know that it was extremely important to them to give good reasons. The, uh, the community referred radiology system had a, a pick list of reasons that they would refresh regularly. So they could pick an initial text and maybe annotate it further, but that they could do it fast and efficient but then they would kind of in batch review and say, hey, should we update our pick list? Is there anything else you've have, been having to type manually uh, you know, more often? So they really paid attention to the, what the message would do. In fact, they were starting to want to put messages on acceptances to say, for instance, I'm not going to stuff around this patient by declining, but next, you know, look at the criteria of really their marginal case, et cetera. So they, they were even looking at, at Acceptance warning <laughs> messages. Robert. Decision support systems tend to have an educational effect, and I suppose more generally, so the health information systems, where these people become accommodated to either how bad or how good the system is, they just get used to it. So I, there's a temporal dimension toward assessing, uh, about assessing usability, to looking over time at how people perceive the usability of a system. Have you looked at any of the projects you've done? Have you looked at usability over time, recognizing it's difficult to do because, as you recommend, systems aren't static. They should feed back suggestions for improvement anyway. So it's a bit yes. a challenge to compare time zero to time one. Mm -hmm. um, and even if you haven't done that sort of thing, how might your framework need to be adapted in order to do those kinds of serial measurements? Yes. Okay. So, so looking at usability over time. I, I mean, I think my bluntest answer to that is uh, is this. Actually, I forgot to comment a, a, a little bit on it. Um, so, one of the answers to usability over time is that uptake graph. Okay. So the idea, and and you'd actually kind of hope for a shape a bit like this one, in that um, that you 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 may buy in a lot of people, but maybe there's there's some more people that you can bring over as uh, as there's been greater acceptance, or perhaps as you've worked some of the rough edges off of it. Now, the HUT project was a pretty traditional implementation. They did very, they, they, just the way their budget and project management worked is they pretty much slammed it in and walked away. It's, they were very lucky to have it work as well as it did with that. So uh, this more represents, to some extent, the, the, uh, the, the word of mouth growth. Um, but yeah, I, so, so I consider did you, it. Did you look at other axes in addition to just that people were using the system, ask them yeah. comments about the system, or just to see if yeah. that perception well, changed? Yeah, I, I mean, so, so, so we did, so, so, so with HUT, just because of the dynamics, because they had implemented early on something that we were evaluating. We came in further after the fact with them than pretty much anything else. We were evaluating two and a half years after implementation, almost three years after implementation. Whereas, uh, say, in shared care planning, we kind of eventually got our wish, and we were evaluating lot right in with the kick of implementation and, and with major changes in the product going on, uh, you know, based on our reporting back. So. Um, uh, let me switch to, to care to shared care planning. So there, it was very much that we looked at how people were using it, what features they were using, and, and we we shut down major features. We said, hey, you've got too many ways to contribute to a care plan. For instance, people are confused. Let's 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 pare down the functionality, and then that was done. For instance, and we continued to get the feedback. And I suppose where we landed was 
It's like, okay, okay, they understand it, you can use it well enough. It's just that they don't want to work, work that way because uh, they learned a, a, an acronym, I don't know, maybe it's used quite a bit. W-I-I-F-M. It sounds a bit like a radio station, W-I-I-F-M. Um, but with that F, you're a little bit worried about what this might stand for. What's in it for me? Okay, and we got it over and over again until finally we just started logging the acronym. Because we'd hear it again and again, what's in it for me? So the community nurse can do a whole lot of care planning to make the patient happier and perhaps to uh, better coordinate the care for the hospital service. But what's in it for me? How does it make their bottom line any better? Or indeed, so yeah, generally the GPs are often partners in the practice, the nurses are often salaried. You know, and, and what's in it for them, uh, for each of them, one from the one paying the salary and the other who has a certain length of work day, often for a flat salary, you know, what, why are they going to do that? So uh, at any rate, we, we definitely uh, adapted for that. Uh, also, just to comment on, on HUT, they were quite terrified by this growth, which is that the total referrals also went up as they went electronic. We think, though, and, and given the exact timing of it, it's actually that HUD Hospital expanded the services that it offered, and so there was just intrinsically a, a greater amount to be referred into the hospital. But when you don't have a control, any meaningful control group, uh, we couldn't really tell whether referrals being easier made more referrals or whether you know some other force was doing that. But it, it certainly certainly got their, their attention. We think it was just that they offered more services. There's a lot of talk about that particular graph. Um, my time for one or two more questions. Probably time for three or four more. Get on with the afternoons. Yeah. Look, I, I hope that gave you some thoughts about uh, the role of health IT evaluation and uh, uh, how it might be done. And I do view it as both a pragmatic and an academic exercise. So um, uh, variously from my home page, you'll we'll find conference papers and such. Is there is there a question remotely? No, I'm just making no, very no question. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so yeah, so view it both as a pragmatic and an academic exercise. I do think that it can be uh, a, an absolutely integral component in the success of health IT deployments. Uh, the, the general literature says what's the success rate, you know, 40% or something for major health IT projects, and we really can contribute to that uh, positive, make a positive change in that, I think, with a good evaluation process, especially one that's embedded in a staged implementation. So, Are these implementations overseen by somebody sort of at the CIO mm -hmm. level? Our implementations are seen at the CIO level. Um, most definitely, yes. Yeah. So, so each district health board has a has a CIO, uh, and uh, at least so, some potential are really a CIO, some are an IT manager. A um, uh, little bit of you know difference. Um, and furthermore, uh, often we're, we're multi-tiered, so there are these shared services organizations, because uh, 20 district health boards is really too many, so they're increasingly pooling their resources. And then there's the, the national level, so there's probably too much oversight. Um, but uh, yeah, the thing is, so what does CIO stand for? He thinks it stands for Chief Information Officer. It stands for Career is Over. Okay? Because of the high failure rate of major projects, it's a very, very dangerous thing. So unfortunately, actually the shared services organizations were the worst for this because they really felt that they needed to be on time and on budget. And all they ever wanted to do was close it down and say they were done. And all we would ever do is say, it's never done. It can always be better. And they'd say, shut up. And we both run to our bosses and we both get mandates to get back on each with our separate roles. So we clashed a lot with the shared services model because even more, so Canterbury District Health Board as a, as a district health board that remembered that it was an elected board was actually quite courageous and wanted the feedback and wanted to do things different. Um, the Auckland District Health Board's collective operating through a shared services organization, the shared services so shared, service organ, shared services organization was quite uh, defensive because they didn't feel that they had the mandate to do anything other than be on time and on budget. And you know they, they weren't connected to the 
not just the CIO, the, the CFO and the CMO are the ones you want. You want the person who's really responsible for the money and really responsible for the medical outcome to be interested in what's going on. But even more than the CIO, the CIO, depending on how much they're a true CIO that sits at the board level, then maybe they can play. If they're an IT manager, then they have to be defensive. If they're a real CIO, they can play. But the CFO, the CMO, they're the people you want. And so shared services organizations we found were a little problematic because that layering, they're just responsible for delivering the service and they couldn't get into that, uh, that big improvement loop in the same way. Right. Well, that was a great question. Why don't we uh, end there? Thank you again. Great.